Just to review a few basic concepts that Fritz and Reiner just told you. So, what is SNORM? I like to think about SNORM like a confocal microscope where you put a tip into the focus. But, you know, fluorescence microscopy or Raman, in all these techniques, your signal is typically frequency shifted with the incident beam. Not so in SNORM. In SNORM, you come in with one frequency and we go out at the same frequency. So this is an elastic light scattering experiment and this poses a few unique challenges. And as you already have heard in Reiner's talk, one thing we have to do is we have to demoderate our signal. And this is because the signal we are interested in is this blue arrow here, the near field scattering. But on the other hand, the background scattering is so much stronger than the blue uh, arrow here. So we have to suppress that here to get an, onto the near field signal. And the way how to do is, is to, demo is to vibrate the tip at a frequency omega. And we demoderate our detector signal at a higher order of this vibration. Another ingredient is that we have to use interferometric detection. And the reason is there are two. One reason is if we have absor absorption in our sample like this, the scattered near field is actually phase shifted with respect to the infinite incident beam, okay? But photodetectors, they are insensitive to the phase because we de detect intensity. So here we need to use interferometry. And another reason is that we have to suppress the multiplicative background. And as Ryan already told you, you can kind of get away with this as long as your reference beam is much stronger than your background field. But there are certain situations where you just cannot um, make this happen and also for a matter of convenience, we might want to drop this requirement altogether. So we want our interferometer to always work, regardless how strong or how weak our background scattering is. So there are a few uh, interferometric techniques uh, that we can use, and one of them is pseudoheterodyne. So the word pseudoheterodyne actually means, heterodyne means you have a frequency shifted reference beam, and pseudo means kind of resembling a uh, experiment where the uh, reference beam is frequency shifted. What happens actually that you have a mirror vibration here and what we think would make a little bit more sense to describe this is to call this a phase moderation technique, okay? So let's look a little bit into the math uh, at first. So this is our typical S-norm setup that you have seen also before lunch. So we have our laser here, we illuminate our tip and then we collect the scattered light from the tip. Now, the scattered light contains the near field scattering coefficient and the background scattering coefficient. And since we vibrate our tip vertically, it makes sense to express this as a Fourier series, where we have these Fourier coefficients appearing here in that sum. So there, in literature, there's some ambiguity. What are actually the bounds of this sum? Here I write it with a, from minus infinity to plus infinity because I use an exponential function as a basis. In some papers you would also see here a cosine function and in which case the bounds would be zero to infinity. But this, and that's kind of a mathematical thing right now here, this is only really valid when our scattered field is a time symmetric signal in, in, uh, uh, in SSZ, so what I mean by this is when you define a tip vibration like this, then E scattered becomes a time symmetric signal. Okay, so this is our scattered field. Ryan has shown this already to you. Now what about the reference? So the reference is created by reflecting our incident field from a mirror. Now the mirror we can make to vibrate like this sinusoidally by applying a voltage to a piezo. And what happens here is that the phase of the reference field is modulated, okay? And we write this mathematically like this, so we have our reference field amplitude, and then here is the oscillatory part of our exponential function. It is a sine wave where m is the mirror vibration frequency, and the variable before that, this is called gamma. And gamma is the depth of the phase modulation, okay? So that's how large we modulate the phase. And this is related by 
this equation to the mirror vibration amplitude and to the wavelengths of your laser line. Okay, and now this is a little bit tedious to work with mathematically, so what we do is we expand this expression in terms of plane waves. This is also known as the jacobi unger expansion, and what now happens is that our oscillatory term looks like this. It's a term that's linear in time, and our gamma moved now in front of the exponential function. Okay, these is not just one term, we have now infinite terms. And as we will see in a moment, these are our sidebands in C.D. Hatterdine's norm. Okay. Also what I should say here is our gamma is related to delta D and to the uh, laser line wavelength. So if we change the laser line wavelength, we have to kind of recalibrate this and we come to this in, in a minute. So we have the reference field with a scattered field both fields interfere now at the detector, like this. The scatter field adds up with the reference field and we square it because photodetectors detect intensity. Now, at first, I just switch a mirror vibration off and this is a schematic of our detector signal. So we see, as usual, we're in contact with the tip, uh, with the sample, so we see our harmonics appearing here and we again describe it as, as Reiner did before, just like one sum, uh, it should be actually only one sum here, and uh, our Fourier coefficients, this time of our detector signal. Now, if I turn on the mirror vibration, this happens. Our carrier frequency, so our main peaks, they reduce a little bit in amplitude, and we now create these red lines. These are called sidebands, okay? So, and mathematically, we write something like this. So now we have uh, two sums here, one which runs over N, which is the high harmonic with respect to the tip vibration, and another sum runs over the small m, which is now kind of the harmonic of our mirror vibration frequencies, okay? So we are now have a signal that's characterized by sum of two frequencies. And uh, you can now go ahead and write down the math for each of the sidebands, this would be, for example, the first sideband. It is the imaginary part of our near field scattering coefficient. And this would correspond, for example, here to two omega plus one n. That's the first sideband. This would be the second sideband. It's proportional to the real part, okay? I just call it here xn. And this would be here, two omega plus two m, okay? So you already see with two sidebands with all the information we need about our near field scattering with the imaginary part with the real part. That's, that's all we need. So how is this detected in experiment? Well, here's the detector signal. And what actually happens in your microscope is that you have one lock in tuned to this frequency and this gives you the Y and there's another lock in the amplifier which detects at this different frequency and gives you the X. Now you don't see this because today we use digitizer cards, it's implemented in software, so there are no physical units uh, outside of your SNORM, but this is what happens uh, in, in internally, okay? So we get Y and X, and with that we can, in principle, determine our near field scattering. There's just one little detail here. We have these functions here, which are called the Bessel functions, J1, and they are a function of our phase modulation maps and also J2 for the second sidebands. These multiply with our real and imaginary part here. And so to measure these here, we have kind of to calibrate our interferometer. Okay, but before I do this, I just want to explain one uh, detail, which I don't have time to, uh, to really go into detail here, is that the multiplicative background appears in this black line here. Okay, so it is isolated here and it does not appear in the red line. And this is why in situ heterodyne, by looking just at the red lines, we can suppress this multiplicative background. Okay, moving on. So, it, a popular way to calibrate a situ heterodyne interferometer is this. We just set both Bessel functions equal, J1 and, and J2. This is the, then called the optimum performance setting so a way how to express this is that you get the best signal to noise in, in all possible conditions. I mean, that's, that sounds a little bit 
shady, but hazy, but um, what does I, I mean? That's basically where you get the best signature noise. So what does it mean? Well, you get onto Wikipedia, and we, here we just plot the Bessel functions. So the first, the Bessel function J1 is the green line here. The Bessel function J2 is the blue line here. And we are looking for the point where they cross. This is our point where we have the optimum performance settings. And the parameter where this happens is gamma equal to 2.63, OK? And if we insert this in our equation, we find that we reach this point for a mirror vibration amplitude that is roughly 0.21 times the lambda, the wavelength of, of the laser line. So sometimes you, want, you, you see this number appearing. Why is it this number? Now you've seen it. This is kind of the point where we can ensure that the both better functions are the same value. And, and this is the calibration we must do. And you see that in a minute how this goes. So if we have done this part here, we can just write down the near-field amplitude and phase signal like so. So our amplitude is simply the square of the sums of our real and our imaginary part, and the phi is just the quadrant arcus tangus function. Just again note, when we change the laser line, we have to recalibrate. If you are off with your calibration for like 2% or 1%, of where it should be the error that you have in the phase signal is also only on the order of 1%. So I would say small errors are allowed. OK. That concludes the theory part. And as Rainer has told you already, near field signals are complex numbers. So I would like just to remind you of a few basics of complex numbers. So sigma is our scattering coefficient, and we express it as a real part, as well as an imaginary part. That's one way how to write down a complex number, or as terms of amplitude and phase. And we can draw a number, complex number, in the complex plane, where this is the real and the imaginary part. And we draw it as an arrow from the origin to here. Okay, So this arrow has a length, and then this would be the phase. So standard operations are, for example, the complex conjugate. In this case, we have the inverted imaginary part. And that just means we mirror this error at that axis here, and it appears down here. Importantly, if we take the complex conjugate, the phase is inverted. Next, how to add complex numbers. So. It's kind of tempting to do this by adding the amplitude and phase because these are the native signals that we have in SNORM, but this is not correct. What we have to do is best just work with the real and imaginary part of the numbers. And in a complex plane, you can do it graphically. Say we have one uh, a number A like this, another number B like this, then that would be the result. And you see the length is not always increasing, okay? So this is wrong, you have to do it like this. Another uh, point is the multiplication and division of complex numbers. If I want to multiply two numbers, here, yes, we can use the picture of amplitude and phase. The amplitudes, they multiply, and if, importantly, the phases, they don't multiply, but they add together, OK? And similar for the division, we divide the amplitudes and we subtract the phases. So these points, they are, they are of use when we want to talk about how to process norm images, like subtraction of background signal, or division, for example, normalization or ratio of harmonics. OK, good. So I would like to explain to you a little bit the operation of pseudo interferometry. Uh, I will do this with the example of the NEOS norm, because that's what we have in our labs. So when you switch on your microscope, you have brought the tip into contact. This is the window that you see here. Okay. So note, I still have switch PSH off here. And this is the trace window of the amplitude. So this is a time axis. This gives me amplitude. Here's a phase trace. And just to show you some signal, what I did, I just moved the focus across the tip, just to show something here. So it is important to note that in this mode, the near snob behaves basically as a lock-in amplifier, just one lock-in amplifier that looks at the frequency of n omega. So this would be the lock in amplitude, and this is a lock in phase, and it's not the optical phase that you see here, OK? What I do next is I switch on CD-Rhein interferometry like this, 
And then the, the usual steps you would do is you would focus on the tip, align the reference arm, align the detector lens, and so on. This is explained in the manual. And also another uh, step you need to do is to set the modulation depth, as we just talked about this in, in a minute ago. And this is this parameter here, right? You need to tell them what is the wavelength of my laser line and then set the voltage of the piezo here. Okay, so this is kind of covered by the manual, I, I hope. In he, this talk, I like to focus on some aspects that are maybe not so well known. And the first thing is, how does the offset sweep actually work? So I think you're all familiar with this image. So this is a well-aligned system. I switched on the offset sweep. We are seeing nice linear ramps in the face, and I have a constant amplitude here. This means I have adjusted this number correctly to my laser line wavelength. Okay, what actually happens is this. So far in this talk, we have treated the scattered field and the reference field just as fields, but the field actually has to propagate from the tip to the detector. So there's a propagating wave component in here that we add to this. So this is kind of determined by the length of the sample arm and determined by the length of the reference arm, okay? And in this configuration, by writing Kx with a positive sign, this would look like this. The negative length, the, the, the length of the reference arm enters with a negative sign, okay? It's a difference. So when we start the offset sweep, the mirror vibrates all the time, but I slowly start moving the mirror towards the beam splitter, like so, okay? And what should happen? Well, this gets smaller, the whole thing gets more positive, so my face is going up, okay? Now, mathematically, uh, we can now take this value, I remind you, linear face frames in the face, constant amplitude, and I take these signals and I plot them in a complex plane. What do I get? I get this here. So the signals are now tracing an arc of a circle. Okay, and this is expected. It's a phase modulation. I'm mo just moving the mirror next, uh, closer to the beam splitter, so I'm not changing the amplitude, and my signal should be on a circle like this. Okay, and here I just try to write it up how the side bands look like. So now importantly, this is only true if you have an aligned system. Aligning means J1 is equal to J2. If it's actually not like this, then you cannot expect a circle. For example, here, J1 is a little bit smaller. So J1 controls the imaginary part, so I'm squishing my circle. And J2 is a little bit larger than, uh, than what it was before, so I'm extending my circle like this. So suddenly for a D-aligned system, we have an ellipse. And when, if I now do the offset sweep around, around this segment of the arc, it's fairly obvious that I now get a modulation in the amplitude, okay? So usually from this, it sometimes it's just more easy to understand these signals by plotting them in the complex plane. So if I now allow my system, then I trace the arc, and this is why we know that in the offset sweep, this tells us that our system is aligned and calibrated. Okay, moving on. Another aspect that's maybe not so well known is that of detector saturation. One problem, and that's fairly sp specific to SNOM, is that we have our laser. Let's say it's an output power of four milliwatts, which is quite usual. Now we go through the beam splitter here, so we lose kind of half of the power. Two milliwatts I put onto the reference mirror, I, and then I now take this beam and then I reflect again here, which is one milliwatt, and I directly focus one milliwatt of power onto our detector. So the reference beam is directly focused onto the, on the detector, and that's one milliwatt for infrared detector is a lot of power to digest. If you look at the manuals, that would be a typically responsivity curve of a detector. So the x-axis is laser power here, and that would be our voltage. What we want to have is that uh, our detector is a linear element. So we want to work in this regime here. But there's a point when the detector curve kind of tapers off like that. And that's a nonlinear regime. At what power level that happens, that depends on your detector. But just as a ba um, ballpark number, that could be one milliwatt, okay? 
So why is this important? As you've seen, we are modulating in SNORM. So we are, have kind of some uh, DC power level from our reference arm and then our signal looks something like this. And we want that our intensity signal translates linearly into a voltage. That is true here. But if I have a reference beam that's just too high in intensity, we are working in this beam area of the curve where we are bending, and so this curve actually gets distorted. And this is when all kinds of effects can happen. For example, the background signal might be modulated into high harmonics. Also what we observe, the noise level is much higher here for some reason. So, uh, what is the solution? The solution is to place an attenuator here and to attenuate the reference beam like this. Uh, let's say, for example, this attenuator takes 50% out of the power, then we have reduced our power here significantly. Okay, And this is now interesting because now I can actually increase this power even more. I can now put more power on the tip, I can increase the scattered field, while I still keep this to acceptable levels. And when people come to our lab, they, po they quickly point out, what is this actually in our reference beam? Well, that's a metal sheet attenuator. Okay, not many people may have used this. And this is one way to attenuate the reference beam. That's what we use in, in, in our labs. And uh, that's also in, in, in IRIS. I come to this in, in a second. And what I did just to demonstrate the effect of this attenuator is this. I, I just uh, take a near-fit measurement on, on some substrate. I look at all three. And in the near-spec software, there's a number here in your windows, this one which tells you the signature noise of your signal. And now let's compare. For zero attenuators, I actually had the highest amplitude level, and I don't show this here, okay? But signature noise was actually only 29. Now I put an attenuator into the reference beam, I reduced the, my power on the detector, the amplitude voltage signal it decreased, but signature noise actually went up, okay? And that's goes to show that in SNOM, there's really a non-trivial relationship between amplitude, strength, and signature noise. And for the alignment, it would be worthwhile just to check out how you can improve SNR. And the reason is, if you assume that your um, noise is kind of a short noise signal, you would need to image at that setting four times as long to get at the same uh, signature noise level. And that means by doing this little step, you just saved yourself so much more time. Your NIASNOM comes with an iris. What an iris does, it crops the reference beam and only lets through a small part of it. That's one way to do it. And what we do, we actually open the iris super wide and we just attenuate the whole part of the reference beam. Uh, we can have a discussion about this, what's the best method. Um, I've, I already talked to a few people here, uh, also to Rainer, and the idea is that inserting an attenuator is the better way if your system is aligned but what could happen if your wave fronts are not really nice, then it may actually be worthwhile to close the iris. But that's a discussion maybe for after the talk. Okay. Good. So far, so good. So a little aspect now about the calibration of the pseudo-terra interferometer is this, the inverted phase contrast. Now, just as a disclaimer, this is an effect that appears rarely. But it, if it does appear, it's really important, and it's important that you know. So, we have aligned our system, and note, I'm starting with a positive ramp here, okay, when I switch on the offset sweep. Here I'm looking at a near-fit phase image of a, a cellulose acetate fiber. It is absorbing at that specific frequency, and we know a sample absorption norm means I have a positive phase contrast, red color, positive phase contrast. But sometimes it happens that you switch on the offset sweep and the line in the phase is actually, it's a negative ramp. And in this situation, our sample would actually yield a negative phase contrast, okay? This happens rarely with the new microscopes, but with the old microscopes, we really do see it more often. Okay, so what's going on here? Uh, which image is correct? Well, in this case, I already know, before I do the experiment, I have a cellulose acetate fiber, it has a strong absorption here. 
I recorded this image. I'm looking at the image after I'm done with my imaging. So here, the recommended approach is where well, you can just invert the face image and then you get to this case here because that's the only way it makes sense. We have to have positive face contrast in SNOM if there's absorption. This is correct as long as you know that your absorption is strong. Because look at this other fiber here, this one. That's a protein fiber, and we know it's weakly absorbing at this particular frequency. In this case, and it doesn't really show well, this is a light red color here and a light blue color here. In this case, you're done with the measurement. It's not correct to just invert this image. And here's the reason. I image the same fiber at a different frequency at that one. And I know here the fiber is for sure non-absorbing. And in this case, the fiber shows up at a light blue color. This is correct. So if you're now confused, let's just walk over all the individual cases. A correct calibrated interferometer, absorption shows up as a positive phase signal. Here, it's quite corrected, it's, it's calibrated correctly, and here we have now an effect that is true. It's a negative phase contrast, and this is a near field effect when the sample has no absorption or very weakly absorption. When the sample is a low refractive index object, like, a, like an organic fiber, but you have placed it on a silicon substrate, or on a gold substrate, which is highly refractive. In this case, you get a negative phase contrast with respect to the substrate, okay? And this is covered by a talk by uh, Iris Neos later on. So this is correct. This is inverted, okay? And the issue is now, if you have no further information and you see a negative phase contrast, it could be this case, no absorbing sample but a negative contrast, or you have an absorption in your sample but the phase is inverted. There's really no way to figure that out in post-process. Okay, and uh, just to briefly uh, tell you why this is like this. So just imagine for a moment we have a phase shifting interferometer. So I'm moving my mirror uh, slowly and then I would be recording an interferogram. Okay, like this. This is just phase shifting interferometry. And if you show this interferogram to your analysis computer, there's no way of knowing if the mirror moved towards the beam splitter or the mirror was moving away from the beam splitter. There is an ambiguity here, okay? So, and what this boils down to that this analysis machine could either be direct, uh, detecting the, the direct term or the conjugate term. And we know conjugate term means the phase is inverted. So this is what happens there, okay? And a similar argument you could make for PSH. But I, don't, I will not go into this detail. So, how to avoid this? Well, just make sure when you do the offset sweep that the ramp is positive. That's it. And now whenever we want to image biologic samples, that's part of our alignment routine, okay, to, to make sure that this happens. And then you're all set. Good. Again, it's, it's a rare family, a phenomenon. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so the question was why the ramp positive because mm -hmm. it goes up and down. So what I mean with ramp is the moment you switch it on, you get a kink because the mirror suddenly retracts a little bit. It's still <laughs> vibrating. And then the first movement the mirror does, it is moving towards the mirror, uh, to the beam splitter. <coughs> so by ramp, I mean this part, this first part. So it doesn't continue from the previous point. It just uh, jumps to the back and then always like should be a positive ramp. Right. Well, I don't know how the, about the microscope internals, mm. but I think that's how I explain it. Can understand why that's the function of the programming of the can, can, can I make yeah. a comment? <laughs> so this information is encoded, so the system knows when you start the PSH, it knows in which direction the vibrating mirror it starts to move. So. The reason why in the new systems you don't see this kind of artifact anymore is because we know the way how the phase should, should, should right. change. So the solution to avoid this kind of artifact is always 
before you do the measurement, start the test signal. And then if you give it a few seconds, you will see that even if this negative ramp is starting, then it's correcting itself. You just need to give it like five seconds, 10 seconds. And then if you watch different harmonics, first, second, third harmonic, you can see that some of them could be synchronized, but one could be like 100 degrees off. But after a while, all of them, they go syn synchronized. Right. And this is the point when you know everything is good and the measurement you do, it's 100% <coughs> correct. Well, thanks for that clarification. I repeat the question. Yeah. <laughs> if I, uh, you are assuming to find the right phase, basically, that right. you are aligning on a dielectric with the, you know, that doesn't absorb or whatever you actually align on your sample, right. you are always uh, never expecting any, you know, contribution from the sample side right. in, so. the, in definition of the uh, right phase. Yeah, so... It's this part, right? It's, so the question was, it doesn't matter where you do this test on your sample, what kind of sample this is. And just look at this again. Um, this is your sample response function, amplitude and phase. This is separate to that. This can be whatever it wants to be. And your signal will always be increasing no matter where you are on the sample. If it's a non-absorbing sample, absorbing sample. But I would say you have to make sure that the background is, is zero because the background may uh, screw things up a little bit. Yeah, this was my, uh, my point, right? If you have you need you know, to have near-field signal, uh, pure near-field signal. Okay. Right. So it would be better to um, align on it. Uh, if you don't know uh, what to expect, to align on a test sample or a test, a dielectric on it and then switch yeah. to another sample. Right. Yeah, I think most people would choose to align on a substrate in, in, in dielectric mapping. But there are very special ESNO modalities like antenna mapping, and then maybe you have to think more about this. Thank you. Yeah. All right, let's move on. Um, yeah, uh, one important point is um, we find this is an issue, uh, especially with uh, weakly uh, absorbing samples like protein fiber cells, which have significant topography because there, this you have exactly the situation that your absorption is just the same amount of contrast as the negative phase contrast. So that's why I, I thought it was important to point it out. Okay, moving on. So this is now the second part of my talk. Um, this is not really specific to PSH anymore, but here I just want to show you how to process the data that you get with your SNOM. So, uh, just let me look at the clock here first. Cool. So, if you do your images, typically two files are saved. One is a file for the amplitude image. And in the near summit, this is kind of the file ending, O3A. Then we have a phase image, O3P. And what I recommend you to do is actually the first thing before you do anything else is to load both files into uh, the computer and combine them to one complex valued matrix. Okay. So program that work really well for this is MATLAB. You have Octave, which is a free MATLAB clone, Python, and so on. There are other programs like Gwydion, Origin X, which may also support uh, complex numbers, but I just find they're a little bit more tedious to work with. Okay. But what I really mean to say is this kind of, is kind of it's tempting to just process the image individually because they are safe as separate files, but they should really be combined to one complex matrix at the beginning. I come to this in a second. Look here. That's my first example. Good question. So, so that's a very typical situation. You don't always see this, but at some point, you're just imaging your samples. And, and just to remind you, this is the fast scan axis here. This is the fiber sample from the beginning. So the image builds up like so, and suddenly you see this. The contrast completely changes. What is going on here? Okay. And so... Uh, it, let's take a line profile along this direction on the substrate. So here you see that the phase signal was going down and it reached the point of minus pi. 
and then this signal jumps up to plus pi and then further goes down. This ramp, what you're seeing here, is it's just likely interferometer drift. So your room heats up a little bit, for example. Then you see this. And this transition is called a phase jump. This data is not incorrect. It's okay. It's just a problem of the visualization of, of your data. Okay? So uh, the first step to illustrate is that I take this line profile and I plot it in the complex plane. And now what I see is that we begin at this point and this is then our trace we have here. And there's no jump anymore, okay? The jump just appears because when you take your arcos tangens functions, the range of your output is from minus pi to plus pi. This is the range, okay? And this is why this visualization shows up like this. So the solution is we multiply a phase offset to our image. And this can be done like so. This is my complex valued image. And here, this is just one number, just one phase number. I just multiply it like this. And then I plot the phase in, uh, uh, by taking the angle, for example, in MATLAB. And then this would be the result, OK? All what it did was I shifted this image in the complex plane. I rotated it by the offset. And now I'm avoiding this place here where this phase jump happens. Am I changing my data when I do this? Well, the answer is no, because there's no meaning to this global phase value. There's no meaning I have a phase of one degree. Phase is meant to be a contrast to something else, okay? And also what I should say here, some people might try to use unwrap on this. Uh, this is really not needed in most situations because most samples have a phase contrast that is well below 2 pi, so there's no need to unwrap this. And unwrapping just brings a whole lot of, of, of different problems. So this is all, we, all you have to do. Okay, so now we have this image, but there's still this phase gradient on because of we had interferometer drift. So the next step would be I correct this drift, and um, so I can do this by taking a line profile along the substrate. I know my substrate is everywhere the same. It's homogeneous. And now I'm doing this operation here. So at every line, I'm extracting the face value here, and I'm subtracting this from the line. And then I, I do this complex value D, and then I just take the angle again, and this is the result. Okay. And what happened here now is the substrate is now completely zero phase. Okay. And my fiber shows up like this. In the complex plane, this arc here, it collapsed to one point, okay, as it should, because there's no reason for this contrast. The substrate is, is all the same. Good. There's just one little issue happening. Um, we have fixed the phase now, but what number should I write down on this axis? What does the amplitude actually mean? And there's a talk about this, I believe, today and this afternoon, where Reinhardt will talk a little bit, if he has the time, about sample and reference, and that in SNOM we need to reference to a known uh, place on the sample. And just to motivate this a little bit, we've already seen there's no meaning to the uh, global phase value, because the propagation distances in the interferometer are not calibrated usually. Also, S, that's kind of the scattering strength of the signal. Well, this depends on the sample, but S also depends on the tip. If you have a sharp tip, it may scatter less, for example. And it also depends how you illuminate on the sample. This is, would be really difficult to calibrate all of this. So for practical purposes, we always want to reference to a sample. And for the, for, uh, a convenient way to do this is just uh, to have the substrate always on the side like this, and then I can use this value as my reference, and I uh, normalize it by complex value division. So just as a reminder, you don't do this, you don't divide phases, you divide the amplitudes and you subtract the angles. This is what you need to do in gradient, for example. If you want to use MATLAB, it's even simpler, just use a complex value division, okay? And that's all you need to do. And when you're done with this, you can then recover the amplitude image with this function and the phase image like that function. Okay, and that's when we are done. Now I have, I can pick this, uh, for example, at, um, on this fiber, I can extract this data. I now have calibrated 
uh, the amplitude, I've calibrated the phase because I know my substrate is silicon, for example. I just set it to one the amplitude. The phase is zero because it's non-absorbing. I now know this has this uh, a kind of response function here. And now I can use the phase, for example, as an indicator of absorption in the sample. And there's going to be a, a few talks on this topic. And this number then you could also use in modeling approaches as well. Okay. So this kind of uh, concludes this chapter here. Um, good. So there are a few uh, things I'd like to say about advanced image processing. And here is an example that is a very special modality of SNOM. It's very special because we don't use a metal tip here, we use a silicon tip. And the goal of this approach is I want to measure, map the antenna modes of my infrared antenna. This is called antenna mapping, and that's, that's a very special mode of SNORM. So briefly, the, the way it works is I illuminate my antenna from below. I excite a fundamental resonance like this. I have my silicon tip here. This probes the Z component of my field, so it's kind of if the fields are pointing out or going into the antenna like this. And then I scatter the lights out like this. So what I would expect is something like this, a dipole remote, high field concentration at the rod ends, and a 180 degree phase jump. What I get is something else. I get this, asymmetric amplitude pattern. The phase jump is not 180 degrees. And here on the substrate, I have a non-zero signal for no reason. And just to remind you, this is a very special mode only in antenna mapping the substrate would expect it to be have zero signal, right? That's a really special uh, modality. I just use it as an example for the next part here, uh, where we talk about background. So the reason is that this happens is this is such a weak scatterer that the background cannot be neglected anymore, even at O3. So let's draw the signals in a complex plane. I extract this point here where the R is. This would give me a vector like this. Here in the expected signal map, this would be something like this, 180 degree out of phase. The arrows point opposite directions. But what I measure is something like this, okay, 128. Um, and this actually is just, uh, here I should point out, it can happen in antenna mapping. But as Reiner also told you, this is relevant if you have biological samples where you just have to use O2. O2 is not free of background. We see in our own experiments, it's 20, degrees, 15 deep percent of, of background, you still might have an O2. And P2 signals when you map these kind of samples. So maybe this would then be also the approach to correct for it, okay? Right, so how can we understand it? Well, I take this value here. This is the green arrow, and this is my background signal. So if I took this now as my origin, as a new origin for the arrows, I would indeed get something which looks more like the expected signal. So just to remind you, I measure this, but I want to measure that. So an obvious correction would be, I just make a complex valued subtraction. So I, from this measurement point, I subtract the background, and from that one I subtract the background, and then I end up with this. And I, if I apply this to the entire image, I have indeed restored a, symmetric mode as expected, and a phase contrast of 180 degrees, okay? Here, in this case, it's easy to estimate the background because I can just use a substrate for this. Good. And just to uh, know that we've used this in, in this kind of e example, and you can also correct approach curves when here you can see an approach curve a significant background. If I do the correction, the approach curve goes to zero signal when I move away from the sample, okay? Just so that you see it. Another aspect is polariton interferometry. And Pavel Alonso will talk about this, I believe, on Friday. So this is a generic experiment. And before with antenna, we looked at the localized Pressman resonance. Now we're looking at propagating polaritons. And usually an experiment would look like this. We have the field coming in like this, and we make sure to make our focus wide enough so we illuminate everything. So here I would illuminate the tip, as we have usually done it. Remember, now it's again, it's a metal tip. And here we have a metal edge on a material that uh, supports a polariton wave. This metal edge, together with the incident field, 
launches a wave on this polariton. And this is now interesting because I suddenly have two fields that illuminate our tip, the incident field and the polariton field. Okay? And what we see is when we move our tip away like this, we get fringes. That's what you have seen in literature, like this. This is not really uh, known. So, so the distance is, for example, in this case, it's the wavelength of a polariton. But why are there actually fringes in the face image as well? So a way out to understand this is to plot these signals in a complex plane. And then what we get is a spiral. Our signal, our line trace away from the gold edge looks like a spiral. And here's a little bit of visualization how it works. This is my complex vector, and this corresponds to this point here. And now I'm just moving my tip away from the gold edge. And this arrow just follows the spiral, okay? And as we move, you see that the amplitude changes like this, but also the phase changes, right? And it, and it, it kind of appears that whenever, in, at least in this case, maybe it's just coincidence, whenever the amplitude is ki kind of at, at the medium setting, my phase is actually at an extreme point here, and so on. So the reason why we have fringes in the face is just because there's a spiral and the spiral is offset from the origin. So here we can now apply the same kind of way of thinking as with the antenna. There must be a background field that shifts my spiral to this point. And we can understand it by looking at the signal in the complex plane. In this case, it's just the incident field that directly illuminates the tip. Okay? And now let's do the same thing. But here I take this as my new origin and I just plot the difference now as my polariton field. And what you see is we have a vector that just rotates in a complex plane. Okay? And this is just what you would expect from a decaying propagating wave. Can you go back to the first instance of that? Uh, Right. So, uh, can you explain what that means? right. So the question is: there are two vectors here, and Fritz says there is a phase change between these two vectors. If you look at my schematic here, the incident field is like a plane wave that comes in like this. Okay. So, the phase of this field is not changed. Everything is fixed in our system. What does change is the propagation phase of our polariton. Yeah, but at the beginning. Oh, right. And so you should have an equal phase at the same time. That's a good point. It's a resonant expectation of a polariton. The polariton is excited and it's phase shift to the force because of the resonant expectation and you are closer or less close to the resonance so of the polariton. you can explain the size of the yeah. phase shift? Yeah, yeah, because you could, you could calculate it easily. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the answer to that question is that at the beginning, you would expect a zero phase shift here, but it's not between the two fields, okay? And they're trying to explain by the resonance excitation of, of the polariton. Close to resonance. Close to resonance, okay. Good. So, and indeed now, if I take the same approach, the same curves, and I just subtract the, this incident field, I get something like this, okay? A decaying wave in amplitude. This is the distance from my gold edge and I get linear phase ramps in the phase, as expected for propagating wave, okay? This is the way we can correct it. And to move on to the next slide. And this is possible because we measure amplitude and phase, okay? Just imagine a hypothetical storm where we don't have interference. You just block <coughs> interference, there's no break, background field. Then you would measure something like this, the field, of the prior time plus the incident field squared, you would be stuck with the fringes. You cannot resolve the fields. But we measure something that's linear in the field because using the ferrometry, and this allows you to do two things. We can subtract E in and isolate this, but also importantly, we can determine the sign of the phase velocity. So we can determine, does the spiral go this way or the other way? And this we explored in this paper, for example, boron nitride in the lower restaurant band, the phase sensitivity, that the phase velocity is a negative sign. Adrian? Five minutes. Ah, okay. Yeah, I'm almost done. So, 
And this is not just like an academic exercise. This has real application. For example, if you look at strongly damped plasmons, they are so strongly damped that you only see one fringe. You cannot do the typical way of analyzing fringes by just looking at the distance between the maxima. But what you could do is you could plot your signal in the, in the complex plane. So just let me briefly explain this. Just a, a sample here. We get our line profile, one fringe here in the amplitude, and another one in the face. This looks like this. It's a spiral, okay, as, as I just explained to it. We move the origin of the spiral, the center here, to the origin of my complex <coughs> plane, and what I recover then is a linear face ramp. And you, you see from this part here, from a fraction of a propagation wavelength, I can already extract the, the, the slope of it and with it the, uh, the, the wavelengths of my polariton. So this kind of processing was applied here. Okay, so with this, I come to an end. I would like to thank the organizers of Monica and Rainer for this great conference. And there's also a poster about more advanced multispectral uh, PSH if you want to check this out. Okay, thank you. All right, thank, thank you very much for the hands-on solutions for, for this. And I, uh, so when it comes to phase jump, since you said it's like a um, relative value, it's not absolute thing that we are looking. So instead of to uh, instead of using some polar uh, color map, just without adjusting it, can can we just use like a sickly color map just to address this problem? I mean, do we need to adjust like mathematically adjust it? Right. I mean, in fact. Right, so I guess that depends on your application. I just did what you said here in this last slide, just with the antenna. Here we indeed used a cyclic face map. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Plus 180 degrees, the same as minus 180 degrees. That makes sense when we talk about antennas. Mm -hmm. But I would say if we want to talk about uh, fibers like this, we usually use a non-cyclic map. Can we also even be a grayscale map? And actually, ideally, there would even not be any negative phase at all. Now we've developed methods how to correct for that if you wish to uh, map very weak absorption in a sample. I see. Okay. So except for antennas, just to summarize, the phase map should actually be from zero to some positive value if you do dielectric mapping. I see. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I have a question about the um, the phase inversion, actually. So sometimes what we see in our experiment is that we have a simple phase inversion in for weakly scattering um, objects like um, like organic microparticles, and uh, it's the same in all demodulations. But sometimes we have a a normal contrast for, for example, uh, second order. And then if we look at fourth order, we have a very strong contrast somehow, and it's inverted. So I, I wonder if that's maybe something that you have also observed in your experiments. Right. I think the only thing I can contribute to this case is that sometimes some harmonics would have the correct signs and others would have the inverted signs. Hmm. OK. And Thank actually, you. if you have this situation, why not just document in it by making a screenshot of the offsets we just should you know what situation you are in? So the solution would be to start this test signal again, and then you will see that some harmonics will be out of phase. Some of them will be synchronized, but after a few seconds, all of them, they go in the same direction. And when you do the measurement, then this contrast positive contrast, negative contrast will be the same in all the channels, and it will be the correct one. I also have an example to show on Thursday. It's the algorithm from the software. It's calculating the amplitude and the phase, and the phase could be indeed 180 degrees. Yeah, but... We, but we know when we apply a voltage to move the mirror, the vibrating mirror, we know in which direction it starts to move. It moves closer to the beam splitter or farther away. And then 
And then because we know how the face should change, that should go up or down, this is something that it's corrected. And then after you do the test signal, you get the, the real data, the real, the correct phase contrast. So in the past, it was unclear whether it's positive or negative, but now it's clear. You just need to do the test signal. That's the, the short, short answer. Sasha? So, Martin, do you have any practical guidelines how to find this background? Uh, I mean, let's say you're subtracting the background, right? So let's say that was an antenna example. Oh, so yeah. you need to find the complex background, right? So right. is there practical guidelines how to find this background in order to do the subtraction? That's a good question. I don't know what background would be. So with we're currently imaging some biological cells and we have a few tricks, like you, you lift the tip up a little so you get out of the near field part and then you can t kind of estimate the background but that you already changed your experiment by then. That's the nice part about this because here we are in contact and I know what the background is. Similar, here, I could probably say far away from the edge, this would be my incident field only. Now, maybe there might be an opportunity to take approach curves. As you can see, maybe you can kind of make an extrapolation from here, from this part, to this part. Can you take a histogram of the image and see where the average is? That would be a background, if it's more or less localized, you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I don't know this. Okay. Thank you. Maybe I would like to comment on this. Um, in this image, the background was rather constant. So it, it happens very often that, and as I showed before in my talk, uh, the background is not necessarily homogeneous. And I think in this uh, example, we use the center of the antenna as, as, a, as, a, as a background. But you need to be careful, and, and using a histogram is, is, is useful because you need to make sure that if before you do such a background uh, subtraction, you need to make sure that it's homogeneous. And that you can do eventually only in smaller areas that are much smaller in the wavelengths. Because typically, this background can spatially vary. And then if you subtract it, you get a complete mess. So I mean, it's uh, it all needs to be done with, with care, yeah? just as, a, as, as an important notice. Yeah. Are there any other questions? If not, then let's thank Martin again.